and we're going to go ahead and get started. So we are so excited. Our presenters today first is Matt Foles, and he is the Vice President of the Outsourcing Department at Harding Schmansky. And I'm not going to read you his bio because obviously you can read, um, but he oversees outsourcing services such as table processing, qualified plan, plan administration, and employee benefits counseling. And as you can see, he's been there since 1995. So he is well versed in this industry, and we are so thankful for it to have his time and his expertise today. And then we will hear from Chad Sullivan, and he is a native of Newburgh. He is an attorney with Jackson Kelly, and he litigates commercial energy and employment disputes. So we are so excited to welcome them today. As I mentioned, um, if you all could just provide your questions or any feedback that you may have in the chat, that way they have the ability to kind of navigate as to what your needs are because we have a very diverse group here today. So thank you all so much. We are so excited to welcome you and have your participation. Matt, if you're ready, take it away. All right. Thanks, Rachel, and welcome, everybody. I uh, appreciate you all making some time to listen in on our seminar today. Uh, I'm sure everybody's in a little bit of, of a different place and kind of where they are as it comes to families first uh, coronavirus Act. Some people have probably participated in things like this in the past, and if you have, uh, this may be a little bit of just a refresher course, but we we did get some questions from some of the folks that work with the Chamber kind of wanting to revisit this particular Act now that, you know, kids are starting to go back to school, um, you know, and it, it was some virtual learning at some schools and in-person learning in other schools. They wanted kind of an update on all of this as as these as these situations where this act might kick in start to crop up again. So we're really just sort of doing this as a refresher and then there has been a little bit of additional information passed um, that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of interject as we go throughout. So that next slide there, if you wanna go ahead and flip it, Rachel. A uh, couple of things I did wanna give you guys because we won't be able to obviously on this short seminar be able to cover every possible nuance of this law, but there are a couple of links there. One is to the Internal Revenue Services uh, question and answers on Families First. And the second one is on the Department of Labor's question and answers related to Families First. And those are actually very well done. Um, so a lot of common questions that people have, you can typically find them addressed on one of those two Q and A's. So definitely if you haven't gone out and looked at those in the past, uh, I would encourage you to spend some time reading and they're they're really just in like a set of question and answer format so they're not too hard to follow. So I wanted to give you those links to the extent you hadn't seen those before. And then you can go ahead and flip over Rachel. And then before I jump into kind of the the credit itself and how it works, I, I'm gonna just a, a little bit of, of a background and I don't necessarily have this on slides, but I thought it'd be good to do a little bit of background. Um, so, what we're gonna be talking mostly about today is, is what's called the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which FFCRA is the acronym that you hear a lot, FFCRA. And it was signed into law by President Trump back when the coronavirus really first got started. So it's been around a little while. And uh, although I will say it's, it was a challenge to kind of get our heads around when it first came out, it has been actually a really good act that they put in place. And it really was designed uh, for the purpose of, of two things. One, it was, it was passed to provide a safety net for employees of companies um, who were not able to come to work for coronavirus related situations. So I'm gonna go over kind of those situations here in just a second. But it was really a law put in place to, to one, let those people do what they needed to do to take care of themselves or take care of their family if they had situations related to coronavirus. And then the second thing that the act did, which was really good for the company, even though the company had to abide by this law and follow the rules, which is a little bit of a, could have been a little bit of a hassle, um, it did provide for a, a, a funding mechanism. So if you had employees as a company owner who had to be off of work for coronavirus, you know, normally uh, if, if you decided to continue to pay those people before this law, it would have been on your dime to pay them where this act actually created a situation where you could get some tax credits from the government to really pay those wages 
uh, for for the company. So you were able to pay your employees to be to be off work to take care of coronavirus, and you didn't really have to foot the bill as a company owner for those wages that you had to pay. So it was a good thing in the end, and I think uh, there were a ton of situations where this was used early on, and I think there are definitely still some that are ongoing, which is why we're doing this seminar today. But I did early on had a lot of clients, uh, companies that were upset about it, mad about it, frustrated about it. But really, I think the spirit of the law was, was a good one. And, and kind of once we got our head around the, the nuances of it, it, it was helpful to have in place. Um, so there really were uh, kind of six identified reasons where this law would kick in. Okay, and, and really the only these six reasons is where this would ever even kick in. So if you had, if you had a situation where an employee just got the flu or if an employee couldn't come to work for, for something other than one of these six reasons, this doesn't come into play. So again, this was designed to address uh, paying people to be off for, for coronavirus reasons. And those six reasons, I'm just gonna read them to you real quick. Again, if, you, if you're familiar with them, it'll be a little repeat. And if you're not, just kind of frame up in, in your head what we're talking about here. So if somebody had to be off work and couldn't work remotely, uh, for one of these six reasons, this law kicked in. The first one was if they were uh, they were required to self-isolate due to federal, state, or local requirements. Um, if they were told to quarantine themselves by a doctor um, and kind of go on that 14-day quarantine and they couldn't come to work and they couldn't work remotely, that was a situation where this law would, would come into play. Um, if they were told to go get a medical diagnosis to find out if they had coronavirus or not, maybe they were exposed to somebody or maybe they were having symptoms and the doctor told them to go in and get tested and they needed to be off for that day to go get tested, that would have been a situation where this law would have kicked in. Uh, those first three reasons I just mentioned, those were what they called self-care leave. Um, and that was, again, them taking care of themselves in one form or fashion. And if you had any of those three situations and somebody couldn't work, you had to pay them basically 100% of their normal pay uh, for up to two weeks, okay? And I'll talk about kind of how the company gets reimbursed for those wages here in just a second. But that on those first three, it was 100% of their pay for up to two weeks. The, the, the last three reasons that coronavirus uh, pay would have kicked in would have been more about taking care of other people. For example, if they had to take care of a spouse or a parent or a child who had, who had coronavirus or had coronavirus symptoms. If, if you had to stay home from work because your, your child's daycare, or your child's school closed, and they didn't have any other daycare to go to and you had to stay home with them. And, and again, if you couldn't work remotely, then that was a situation where the employer would pay you, to take care of those kids. And then there was a kind of a catch all that just was like if the employee uh, was experiencing a similar condition to if, in a, if an employee's dependent was experiencing those similar conditions. So those last three were more about taking care of other people as opposed to taking care of yourself. And those you didn't have to pay 100% of their normal pay. You only had to pay two thirds of their normal pay. So even though there were six ways this law would kick in, the amount that you were required to pay them varied depending upon which of those six scenarios was causing the, causing the situation. And then one of those reasons and only one of those reasons, the one about having to stay home to take care of a kid under age 18 because their school was closed or their daycare was closed, that one reason alone uh, also had a second uh, paid time off requirement that lasted an additional 10 weeks beyond those first two weeks you had to pay. So if somebody had to stay home and take care of a child under age 18 because their school or daycare was closed, you actually had to pay them that two thirds of their normal pay for up to 12 weeks total. Um, and then you could take the corresponding tax credit for those wages to pay for that. But five of the six were only a two week period of time you had to pay them for. And, the, and one of the six was actually a 12 week period of time. So that was kind of the difference between between those and, um, you know, to the extent somebody's already used up their two weeks back in March and April when this first got started, 
you know, they're done. They're out of they're out of required paid time off for this law. It doesn't start over again in the fall or anything. They've used up what they had available. Um, so just to point that out, we've had some people ask that question of like, did anything get passed when school started back up that we have to do an additional two weeks or anything like that? And that is not the case. Uh, it's still limited to just those two weeks. So now that I've kind of just given a little bit of a summary of kind of like when this law kicks in, my slides are more built around how you, how you get tax money back to, to help the company pay for these wages. So before this law existed, uh, before coronavirus existed, if somebody went on a, on a FMLA or a paid leave situation, you may or may not have had to pay them if somebody's home. Um, but if you did pay them, it was sort of on your dime to pay them as a company. In this case, as I said earlier, you're required to pay people if they meet one of these six situations, but the government's going to give you the money to, to make those payments. So you got to go through the legwork, you got to go through the, the steps to make it happen, but at the end of the day, you're not physically going to be out the money to pay them. And how, and how that would work is through a payroll tax credit. Um, so on the slide that's on your screen right now, we're going to talk about that payroll tax credit and kind of how that works. And, the dates that are in parentheses here, that's kind of when this all is in play. So this all started for payroll after April 1st, and it, it's scheduled to end right now on December 31st, 2020. So unless they extend this act right now, it's scheduled to, to no longer exist at the end of this calendar year. Now, coronavirus doesn't get under control between now and then. It wouldn't surprise me at all if this gets extended or they might even potentially add some additional weeks to it if it goes over into 2021. But as it stands now, this, this ends at the end of this calendar year. So the scenario where, let's just take the scenario where maybe somebody had to be home uh, because they actually had coronavirus themselves and you had to pay them 100% of their pay for two weeks. So let's just say that ended up being $5,000 in wages that you had to pay that person over those two weeks. You, you as the company are obviously making that payroll, you're paying them that money. So temporarily that's coming out of your checkbook as a company owner. But then there was a really quick mechanism that was put in place to give you that $5,000 back. And they did it through allowing you to, to take a, a payroll tax credit. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that on the next slide here in just a second for getting that money back. Uh, in addition to a credit for the actual wages though that you had to pay, you also were able to take an additional credit for if you were paying for health insurance for that employee while they were out, you could take a credit as well for that. And um, these wages that you had to pay under FFCRA were, were were subject to Medicare taxes for the employer. So you could also get a credit for those additional Medicare taxes. So the credit was kind of a combination of the wages themselves, cost of maintaining health insurance for that employee and your Medicare taxes on those wages. So you were really able to recoup all of those. And then Rachel, if you wanna switch to the next slide. Um, I wanna talk about the logistics of how that credit works and how you get that money. Um, Basically, though, it's immediately available, and what it does is once you've calculated what your credit uh, that, you're, that you have coming to you, instead of like filing a form and having the, the government send you money, what you did was you actually just reduced payroll taxes that you would have to be paying for all of your other employees. Um, so in the first number one and number two there, you know, for all those other employees that aren't on FFCRA, you're obviously paying in your share of social security and Medicare taxes at each pay period. And you're also paying in the amount of money that you withheld from their paychecks for federal income taxes and social security taxes and Medicare taxes on the employee side. So normally you would pay that money in every pay period. But in this case, if you had any credits coming to you for those FFCRA wages or related expenses, instead of paying in those payroll taxes, you would only pay in those payroll taxes minus the credit you had coming to you. So, so in a simple example, in that situation I gave earlier where you paid $5,000 in FFCRA wages 
and your next payroll tax deposit would have normally been twenty thousand dollars, you know, except for this credit, you would only have to pay in a you'd only actually pay in fifteen thousand and you would keep five thousand dollars to sort of reimburse yourself for those FSPRA wages. So that's how they did it logistically and it just it got the money back in the company's hands a lot quicker than actually having to file a form and request money back and, and waiting for it and that kind of thing. Um, in a, number three here is talking about a fairly rare situation. I don't know that I've seen it yet, but if you, if you were pretty small, this could potentially happen. If you ran into a situation where the credit that you had coming to you as a company was more than the, the, the payroll taxes that you would otherwise be depositing, uh, so in this case, let's say maybe your normal payroll tax deposit was only going to be 4000 but you had a $5,000 credit come into you. Well, you can only reduce the 4000 down to zero, obviously. So you would pay in no payroll taxes, but then you would, there was a form 7200 that you could fill out to get that additional $1,000 paid to you in the form of a refund. Again, that's fairly rare, but I guess in a small company situation, that could definitely happen. And then just a little logistical thing there too. Obviously, all of this stuff created changes to the Form 941, which is a which is the payroll tax form that gets filed at the end of each quarter. There were some reconciliation lines added to the 941 to kind of pull all this together, so that what they actually received from the company in form of payroll deposits, you know, is reconciled to what their what their credits were and that sort of thing. So if you've been through that, you've experienced that by now once for the second quarter and you'll be experiencing it here fairly soon for the third quarter as well. Um, okay, you can flip to the next slide, Rachel. Just a couple other things to note related to uh, these credits and these wages that uh, are really important that I did, I do know that we had some clients kind of trip up on this, so I wanna point these things out. Um, if you're paying wages to somebody under this act, this FSCRA act, those wages themselves are not subject to the employer's share of social security tax, that 6.2% payroll tax. So because that's true, you're, you need to set up separate earnings codes inside your payroll systems when you go to pay people these. You don't want to pay them just under your normal regular wage categories because it's not going to be able to tax these wages properly if you do that. So definitely get with your payroll providers if you haven't had to do this already, make sure you get those set up right so that it taxes them properly. The other benefit of having those separate earnings codes set up is when it comes time to reconcile on your 941 credits that you were entitled to that you took, you know, you're gonna be able to pull out those FSCRA wages very easily from your, you know, your normal ongoing wages. Those are gonna stick out if you have them in like a separate bucket inside your payroll system. So that's really important from a, from a getting it done standpoint. Uh, the third bullet point is just speaking to, uh, if you took a uh, payroll protection program loan, a PPP loan, you know, when you start going into the process of trying to get that loan forgiven, you know, you're gonna have to prove that you spent that loan on payroll and some other things. Any, any dollars paid out under this act for Families First for COVID pay is not eligible payroll for forgiveness. That would be sort of like double dipping, like you would be able to get the payroll tax credit and use it for loan forgiveness from PPP and they don't let you double dip there. So just know that when you're filling out your PPP loan forgiveness, you got to pull out these, these COVID wages and, and not try to take a payroll forgiveness on those, or a loan forgiveness on that, on those dollars which is, again, is another reason why having those separated in your payroll systems is, is a good idea. Um, and then the last bullet point that I mentioned, there's three questions that were added to the DOL's question and answer um, site that I pointed out earlier in my presentation, questions 98 through 100. They are very on point as, you know, kids started going back to school there were questions in there about, you know, if my child, if your child's school was operating on like an alternate day schedule, like, you know, the school was open all the time, but your child was only allowed to go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then a different cohort of students went Tuesday, Thursday. There were some questions about on those days where your child wasn't allowed to go to school, were those days potentially eligible for pay under this act? 
uh, even though the school is technically open? And the answer to that question was yes, that if, if you're not allowed to send your child to your school, to their school, based on the way the school decided to let people come back, those days where you had to stay home were eligible for this, for this pay. Again, all this is only true if, you know, you obviously couldn't find other childcare for them or if you weren't able to work remotely. Uh, but basically the answer to that question was yes. And then the, the second question, question 99 addressed, if the child's school was giving you as parents a choice to either attend in person or to participate remotely in a learning program, and you chose the remote learning program, even though the school was open, could you also then potentially be paid under this act? And the answer to that was actually no, which kind of surprised me. It said, because the school's child is not closed, the school is open and you chose not to send them to the school, then that didn't qualify under this act, which that actually kind of surprised me, but that was, that was the final answer that the Department of Labor came out with. Um, and then there's another question on there too, question 100, which is not very applicable, but those first two I thought were very applicable, so I thought I would just point those out to you. So, uh, Fairly quick refresher on all of it. Um, I, there really hasn't been a lot of new activity in this area since maybe, I mean, there was a ton of activity back in March and April and May, but this is fairly lined out now and working, working pretty well. Um, but we did want to address those questions about going back to school in the fall that, that I just read to you. So again, I'll, I'll be kind of monitoring the chat here. And if I see any questions that come up, I'll, I'll try to address those when we get to the end. Um, and I think it's ready to turn it over to Chad. All right. Thanks, Matt. Good job. Uh, well, welcome and congratulations to everybody on this call. You have made it to the first work day of stage five of Indiana's back on track, which uh, probably everybody knows is kind of the last stage before uh, we get back to normal, whatever the, the new normal is. Uh, but I know a lot of employers have benchmark stage five as uh, the date they would start to return a uh, full complement of employees to the workforce. So I'm going to dedicate a, a portion of my time to uh, some legal and practical guidelines uh, involving returning employees to work and then uh, highlight some updates on the FFCRA. So uh, kudos to your local chamber, Rachel and Vicki, for having the foresight to schedule this seminar on day one uh, of employers for stage five. So kudos to you guys. Um, one, one hot topic um, with returning employees back to work will be OSHA uh, and Indiana's version, IOSHA, uh, enforcement uh, regarding safety in the workplace related to COVID. Uh, and if you uh, look on the Department of Labor website, Indiana's Department of Labor website right now, uh, at the top of the page and covering about half of their first page is a link to filing non-formal complaints uh, related to COVID-19. So I do think that both federal and state are gonna be flexible. They've stated they intend to be flexible regarding uh, OSHA complaints uh, along the lines of, you know, I don't feel my, my work is, is safe uh, in doing enforcement guidelines regarding safety issues. But where I think they will be more stringent in their guide, in their enforcement is on retaliation and whistleblower claims. And those work similar to the discrimination claims that, that we're all familiar with Title VII and, and ADA that if an employee makes a complaint to the employer uh, that they don't think it's safe, or if they make a complaint to the federal or state agency, uh, you cannot retaliate against that employee for making a good faith uh, complaint regarding safety. Uh, so if you do have an employee that makes such a complaint directly to you or to an agency, uh, you need to make sure that your supervisor's employees know uh, that no retaliation will be taken against that person for making that complaint. Uh, OSHA has classified COVID-19 as a recordable workplace illness. Uh, so if you have an employee um, you know, that tests positive, uh, you'll need to 
put that in your, your COVID or your OSHA forms as a recordable workplace illness. There's, um, like I said, a lot of leniency, flexibility um, on the uh, general duty clause, uh, which probably next slide would be good uh, for that, Rachel. Um, the, the employers do have a general duty to provide a safe workplace, uh, which would include, you know, susceptibility of contracting COVID-19. Um, so you want to make sure you're doing, you know, reasonable uh, steps to, to do what you can to provide a safe workplace against COVID-19. Uh, there is quite a bit of guidance out there right now. Um, there's OSHA has specific guidance for particular industries, um, healthcare, retail, construction, frankly, quite a few uh, other industries where they give specific guidance and advice for your industry. Um, and, and OSHA really does have a pretty good website uh, right now with various guidance uh, to help you out in preparing for uh, having a full workforce uh, back in your place of business. Uh, next, uh, one last thing on OSHA before we, we move on from that. Um, another topic that OSHA said they will uh, be lenient on is enforcement actions for certification requirements. Uh, a number of uh, industries have certification requirements on an annual basis. Uh, OSHA says they're going to be lenient on those, uh, but they will look for some good faith efforts uh, to try and comply with certification. And that may mean doing some training online, um, you know, and also scheduling that certification as soon as reasonably practical uh, once you're able to do it. So uh, express guidance uh, from OSHA is there'll be some flexibility, uh, but they will at least look for some good faith efforts to comply with that. Uh, next slide, if you would, Rach. Workers' comp is a, another area that uh, is getting a lot of conversation uh, in relation to COVID-19. Uh, workers' comp generally uh, requires either an injury or illness occurring at work during activities required for work. Uh, the big issue that remains to be seen is how employees will prove causation here meaning how are they going to prove they got COVID at work and not somewhere else uh, because COVID is so prevalent throughout our entire society. Uh, most people that are writing, commentating on this say it's going to be extremely difficult for employees to prove that they got COVID-19 at work. Uh, the Indiana Department of Workforce Development has put out a statement on it where they've said under our laws, the state cannot tell employers they must automatically cover employees who contract COVID-19. Uh, whether an individual contracts the virus in the course and scope of their employment is a determination that must initially be made by the employer. So the DWD is kind of throwing that back in the employer's lap uh, to make an initial determination. Uh, now there may be instances where you, know, you can show that and prove uh, that regarding you know, direct interaction with an employee that, that caught it and someone had been quarantined prior to. Um, so it's not, I don't want to be too broad here and say, you know, an employee can never prove they got it at work, uh, but it's probably going to be difficult in the vast majority uh, of situations. Uh, some employers may want it to be covered under workers' comp. You've got damage caps uh, and immunity from, from other liability and civil suits uh, if it is covered by workers' comp. So uh, the main takeaway I think on that is there's not a real black and white on this. Uh, if you get someone who, who is gonna be out of work, especially for an extended period of time with complications from COVID-19, uh, you wanna take a close look uh, before you make any determinations on workers' compensation. Uh, next slide. So kind of on the, the practical here of, you know, what, what to do when you have employees returning to work um, and you need some, some guidelines and policies to be in place. Uh, some or many of these you may already have in place as you've had some people in the workplace. 
Um, but one thing you want to look at regarding your old policies is that practically every agency that has enforcement jurisdiction over employment laws, your Department of Labor's, your Department of Workforce, your OSHA, your EEOC, all of them have brought up an expectation that employers are going to be flexible uh, on, on some policies and some issues uh, during this extraordinary time. And one particular policy I want to point out is attendance policies. Uh, a lot of employers uh, have in the past gone to no fault attendance policies. And, and in some circumstances, those are very good policies to have in place. But I would caution you in, in this COVID pandemic time uh, to maybe take a look at those and have a little flexibility in this time period uh, where COVID-19 is, is prevalent and being a little more flexible on some of those policies because uh, the enforcement agencies have, have set an expectation of seeing some, some flexibility. Some things you want to do upon returning to work, and most of these uh, come from OSHA's guidance on returning to the workplace. Uh, again, that's one of the, the good sources that is on the OSHA website that you may want to take a look at. Uh, but kind of in a bullet point checklist fashion, uh, you want to do a hazard assessment. You want somebody to look at the workplace, how your employees are working, uh, specifically looking for uh, COVID uh, contamination type situations, making an assessment of the hazards and then looking at what you can do to minimize those hazards. You want to have hygiene policies in place. Uh, that could be notices around the office to wash your hands on a regular basis, uh, having hand sanitizer throughout the office, uh, making visitors um, potentially use hand sanitizers uh, before entering the, the interior of the office. Uh, so you want to look at hygiene policies that don't have them in place. You want to put them in place. Um, the one we've heard so much about, there's even country and Western songs talking about social distancing and staying six feet apart. So, um, but it's some, something you should have a policy on and you want to look at, um, you know, a lot of places may have call centers or uh, billing departments where you have a lot of people uh, in one place. You really need to look at those kind of places and see if you can distance them out, uh, use multiple rooms, maybe even use teleworking uh, situations. Next, you wanna have identification and isolation policies. You know, what are you doing to want to identify sick employees and then once they are identified, um, you know, how are you handling isolation of that employee from the workplace? Next, you want to look at some what are generally called engineering controls. Um, some examples of these are, you know, if you've been anywhere that has a cash register, you've probably seen the plastic shields that are up uh, in front of the person working the cash register. That's an example of an engineering control uh, that's been put in place to help uh, prevent or minimize contamination risks. Uh, another one uh, that is been seen is, is quite helpful is increasing ventilation, uh, more airflow throughout an office space, uh, be another engineering control uh, that you may want to look at and see if that's an option for your particular workplace. And final, uh, finally, training. Um, you know, we've talked about a, a number of different policies and changes. Uh, training is key to make sure your employees uh, know about these new policies, know that you plan to enforce these policies. Um, you know, there are uh, guidelines that you expect them to follow. Uh, so if you're in implementing new policies, make sure that your employees are well trained and, and know about it. Next slide. Uh, another thing that's being talked about quite a bit, uh, both federal and state level, uh, are, is legislation to protect uh, businesses and employers against civil liability uh, by people who have contracted COVID and are alleging they contracted the COVID at your place of business. 
Um, there is uh, pending legislation in Illinois and Michigan uh, to tell you how fast this is moving. When I uh, drafted this slide last week, it was uh, a bill and now it's been signed by the governor. So it's a law in Ohio uh, that provides uh, some immunity for businesses against lawsuits um, by people that have contracted COVID. And basically it says that the business will be immune unless that business has uh, been reckless, uh, has re acted with reckless conduct, intentional misconduct, or willful or wanton misconduct. Um, you know, so basically, you know, if you are taking reasonable, practical steps to try and prevent uh, the, the spread of COVID in your place of business, you will have civil immunity against those type of lawsuits. Um, Indiana's legislative session doesn't start till um, the beginning of next year. Uh, there are a number of business related uh, interest groups that are championing and lobbying for similar legislation in Indiana. So I think you'll almost definitely see it brought up uh, for discussion and consideration. Um, we'll just have to see if it gets passed and, and signed by the governor, but um, I, I anticipate there will at a minimum be some, some conversations regarding a similar law in Indiana. Next slide. So a little bit of a recap on the return to work guidelines or best practices. Um, you wanna ensure you've got people spaced out uh, the best you can, maintaining a minimum of six feet. If you can do more than six feet, that's even even better, six feet is generally seen as the minimum. Uh, something that, you know, depending on your particular workplace, but if you work at a place uh, where everybody comes at the same time and utilizes the same bank of elevators, uh, which would make it practically impossible uh, to, to maintain spacing, uh, you may need to stagger start times and end times uh, so that you don't have basically all of your employees standing in front of the elevators at the same time. So uh, you may want to stagger your start times by you know, 15, 30 minutes uh, to avoid that gathering of employees in one, one place. Uh, same for break times, uh, training times, uh, doing what you can to minimize when you have a group of employees all in the same place. Uh, you want to provide and mandate the use of PPP, PPE, which is personal protective equipment. Uh, when distancing can't be done, you know, the one that we're all most familiar with now are, are the face masks. Um, so you wanna look at um, providing those uh, and mandating the use uh, when appropriate. You also wanna provide employees with tools they need, um, such as you know, sanitizing wipes, uh, sanitizer, hand sanitizer, uh, you may want to be scheduling uh, exact times for common workplaces uh, like the, the copier in the office uh, so that it's regularly cleaned and sanitized uh, by someone on a regular basis. And then finally, there, like, like Matt said, there's not been a lot of new things on the FFCRA. Um, you know, the paid leave acts basically. Uh, but there has been one thing that, that fairly recently a, a New York federal court uh, ruled that four parts of the guidelines or regulations by the Department of Labor were um, illegal and should be abrogated. Uh, just uh, about 10 days ago, the Department of Labor came out with uh, revised regulations Kind of addressing these four areas uh, that the the federal court uh, said the regulations were unenforceable and a couple of them they stood their ground a couple of them they've changed so because those are new regulations and there was for a while some uncertainty uh, as to how that federal court case in new york was going to affect people i want to want to highlight those uh, so the first thing was about uh, work availability the regulation said that for you to get the paid leave uh, under the paid sick leave or the paid FMLA, uh, you had to be uh, unable to perform work that was available. 
So for instance, if you had been laid off or furloughed, uh, there was not work available and therefore you wouldn't be eligible for the paid leave. The New York court said, no, we, we don't think that's proper uh, and they abrogated the, the rule. The DOL came back with their new regulations and gave further explanation uh, in hopes of uh, kind of preventing further attacks on that regulation, but stood their ground and said, no, uh, we reaffirm that if there's not work available uh, that the person's missing, then they are not eligible for the paid leave. Uh, similarly, uh, there was uh, regulations regarding intermittent use uh, of the paid leave. The regulations initially said that an employee could not use the paid FMLA intermittently, uh, which means kind of here and there for a half day off and on, um, unless the employer agreed to it. The New York court said they didn't think that was proper and the employee did not need employer consent to take it intermittently. DOL did the same thing here and said, no, uh, we reaffirm our, our regulation you have to have the employer's consent, but again, just provide a little more background or reasoning uh, for why they have that regulation. The third item that was overturned by the New York court was the definition of healthcare provider. Um, under the original statute, uh, healthcare providers could be exempt from these paid leave acts. Uh, it was their option. Uh, whether or not they wanted to be covered by these paid leave acts. And the Department of Labor said that basically any business that provides health care is subject to the exemption. New York, New York court said that's, that's too broad. Um, it should only be basically the doctors providing the, the actual health care. Uh, DOL took kind of a middle ground here. Uh, narrowed it down from the whole business to the individuals who are performing services related to the healthcare. And they've provided some definitions um, within their new rules to, to help that. And the fourth thing was regarding documentation. Uh, the original rule said documentation should be provided to the employer by the employee prior to taking leave. New York said, no, we're not going to require that. DOL, again, kind of took a middle ground uh, and said, okay, we won't do it prior to, but it needs to be provided as soon as reasonably practical uh, upon knowing they need the leave. So a, a few little tweaks there uh, based on the New York court. Uh, no, no monumental shifts, but they are pretty recent tweaks, and, and that's why I wanted to, to bring that up. So. Uh, with that, I think we'll move on to the, the question section. So if you have people, um, if you have any questions, I thought it would just be the participants, Matt, not the uh, presenters who'd be getting questions, but I, I see Matt's posted one. So I'll, I'll start with that, which says, um, the changes the DOL made related to the New York court, and those been updated on the DOL's Q&A site yet. Uh, and so the answer to that is yes. In fact, if you, if you look at those, they've got a little bracket uh, next to those questions that have been updated that say recently updated, um, paraphrasing in light of the New York court case. So you, you can actually see in the Q&A is the ones that have been tweaked uh, based on the, the new rules. And I think we had one other question that we got in advance of the seminar. Uh, I'll read that off uh, real quick. Uh, and that one says, can my employer state that refusal of a COVID test would count as a voluntary resignation, thereby dismissing unemployment benefits? Um, so really, it's kind of a two-part question. Uh, one is, you know, can an employer require a COVID test prior to coming back to work or returning to work? Uh, the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, a little bit of a yes, but uh, because if someone uh, refuses to do that for something that's protected um, under Title VII, such as if they had a, a bona fide religious belief, 
that would preclude them from taking a COVID test. Uh, you could not you know, require them to without running afoul of Title VII. Uh, but assuming there's not you know, exceptional circumstances like that, an employer can require a COVID test before returning to work. Um, and also, uh, unemployment has a Q&A uh, similar to what we've been talking about from the Department of Labor. Uh, and it addresses if an employee refuses to return to work uh, when work's made available, that will be a disqualifying event for unemployment. And there's actually a form on the DWD website uh, that you fill out to let the DWD know that an employee has been offered to return to work and it's refused uh, and therefore most likely will be rendered ineligible for further unemployment benefits. So with that, anybody else have any questions? Okay, well, we appreciate your all's time. And I'm if just, you think of I'm anything sure else that you one. want to email, did somebody pop in this one? Yeah, we got one, one just okay, popped there up. There we go, okay. Um, I'll read it, Matt, if you've got something, jump in, I'll give a, a short answer. Um, but the question is, are there guidelines for recommended types of COVID testing for employees that employers should utilize and limits on assigning cost of required tests. Um, you know, so I don't know that I've seen any what I would call guidelines for which tests to use. I think anything that's been approved by, you know, local and state health departments um, would be what I would recommend. Uh, as far as the costs, if you, the employer, are requiring the test, uh, then you will need to pay for the cost of the test. Well, if you think of anything else, you can always email me and I can check with our wonderful presenters. Please don't forget to answer the poll. All you need to do is click poll in your toolbar. And outside of that, thank you so much to each of you for spending your time with us today. And thank you so much to Matt and Chad for providing us with this information because to most of us, this goes over our heads. So we sincerely appreciate their time and their effort. No problem. Thanks guys, everybody have a great day. Thank you.